Welcome to the Free Marketeers, the official podcast of the Free Market Foundation. Hello, listeners, and uh, welcome back to another episode of the Free Marketeers. Uh, I am Martin van Staden, and as always, I am joined by Mpiaki Blamini and Chris Hatting here at the Free Market Foundation. Uh, and this week has been quite uh, controversial, and I think uh, we'll jump right into that uh, a specific topic and of course that is uh, President Soro Ramaphosa who announced sometime this week I believe two days ago uh, that the South African Reserve Bank will be nationalized uh, now this is of course in uh, in my opinion in uh, contradiction with uh, earlier statements he made saying that the independence of the SARB is sacrosanct I think that's a direct quote from him um, yeah I mean if, if we look at Venezuela and we look at Zimbabwe and we look at, I don't know, Weimar, Germany, uh, every time you had hyperinflation, every time you had complete economic collapse, the central bank was in some way involved. And if you dig deep enough, you'll see that the central bank's independence was in some way compromised. So uh, I, for one, am quite concerned about what's going on here. Uh, Chris, uh, what are your uh, thoughts on the nationalization of our central bank? So I want to make the point that, you know, public ownership in the way that he's talking about, it doesn't denote that it's going to go off the cliff. You know, one doesn't necessarily sufficiently mean the other one. But to me, it's an indicator of that's the direction in which the government wants to move. Mm. It's part of their, you know, view of the role of the state. Mm. They want to use the resources of the Reserve Bank for their projects, their grand social engineering and the like. So it's not, you know, not don't fall for the trap of being sensationalist about it, but it's another indicator of where we're going. Mm. So I think you would be a fool to ignore these signs mm. and to just think, you know, uh, it's going to be fine, mm. re- you know, regardless of who takes it over kind of thing. It's not an ANC matter. It's mm. a case of if the government's in charge of it and its mandate is compromised mm. and it's not independent, they can use it for how they see fit. Mm. That leads to then the devaluing of our currency, mm. hyperinflation, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, no, look, I think you need to be reading between the lines always. Mm. Never just take what government says or does mm. on face value. Always look for agendas. Uh, Mpiaki, what do you think? Well, uh, I, I agree more with Chris on this. It's not uh, because, for example, uh, I think less than 10 of uh, central banks worldwide has have some kind of private ownership. The most important, important of which is the U.S. Central, uh, central federal Bank, Reserve. the Federal Reserve, yes. And then uh, the 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 English the, the the Bank of England, it's uh it, it's completely state owned, but it's it's one of the most independent central banks in the world, and so it's uh like like you like Chris has already said, it doesn't mean that it's going to fall off the cliff, but what we do what we should be worrying about is that there is this political pressure to remove. I mean, there is absolutely no reason for it to remove yeah. this uh, private ownership. So the fact that there is this political pressure to do that should should and this i believe this will be reflected in the market price of the rent relative to other currencies which will be reflected in the price of our bonds eventually it's just that uh when you take this particular step it's an indicator to the market that you plan to interfere with the bank's mandate and then it's reasonable in the effort to expect that if you do that then you you might devalue the value of the rent, and you might eventually end up having something as uh, something like hyperinflation and so on and so on. So that's my view on it. I don't think we should be uh, we should we should worry about it more than we worry about something like uh, expropriation without compensation, right. for example. But yeah. it's uh, it's a it's it's a bad thing that uh, should worry us that there is this pressure existing. I think that stuff like expropriation without compensation that's an indicator of where things you know you have to take these factors in into context so if we say the american and the english uh, central banks Mm. are um, that they're independent they've kept their independence even though the government is involved Mm. that they have got strong traditions of liberal democracy and individual freedom Mm. in south africa we don't necessarily have that so we have to look at the context of each country and what these sorts of moves tell us yeah, no, that, that's exactly my point. And, and listeners, if you're hearing a background noise, the power just went out here at the FMF, so you're going to probably hear the generator in the background. They're trying to silence us. Yeah, <laughs> uh, we're sitting in a dark room currently. Uh, but anyway, so uh, I, I agree broadly that, of course, uh, public ownership does not necessarily mean that it's going to lose its independence. But, I mean, we saw this in South Africa with parliamentary sovereignty mm. in the previous century. 
the the British who were living here and they said no but look look at what happened in the UK we protected civil rights uh, like you said uh, you need a tradition and in mm. the UK they had a very strong constitutional tradition they tried to transplant it into South Africa it was a complete disaster mm. now I I'm just I, I don't want to give government any kind of room to maneuver on right. this I mean even though it may be small government already by virtue of the law can already dictate to the central bank mm. i mean there's virtually no it's it's not like the central bank is a completely private institution and mm. can do whatever it wants it still takes its cue from monetary policy essentially decided at, at national level by the government but even though this is a small thing i think there is there is a there is a, a I, I don't know if you want to call it a symbolic or a principled uh, reason for me to be concerned i mean it, it seems like, especially for, for the radical left, that they see it as symbolic. They yeah. want to say, this is a private institution currently, and now we're going to take it back and give it back to the people. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that's just the first step. Yeah. I mean, the next step is going to be, uh, they're probably going to want to amend the constitution to change the mandate. I think the mandate of the SARB now is something like uh, keeping the value of the currency stable or something like that. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure of the exact wording. And we already saw last year or two years ago, the new public protector is saying that should be changed and the central bank should now uh, look at unemployment no. and try to keep poverty down and no. all these ridiculous things that have nothing to do with a central <laughs> bank. Now, I don't think that's gone now. I think that we're re restarting that process and this is a first step and the next step will be constitutional amendment, etc. So I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. Biaki? Oh, just, uh, just just to clarify, the the, the American do have the American uh, Federal Reserve does have private ownership. It's the, it's the English bank that doesn't have uh, private oh, ownership. Okay. Yeah, but on the on, on those uh, two points, I like on the strength of uh, institutions that have been tested over time. I think the in in South Africa, the government has hold, has had already has had has so much de facto control over the bank. The fact that we have had a reasonably uh, independent bank or the mandate has been in, uninterfered with as much as it has been has been because the the government has just decided not to interfere mm. it has just been a decision by government it hasn't been because the the constitution has been stopping them or mm. anything it just it just, just has been it's one of those rare occasions <laughs> or like even under i'm surprised that even jacob zuma didn't try too hard to interfere like yeah. it's, it's 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 still a surprise yeah. to me but uh, uh i'm not saying that we should be um complacent not mm. by any means but uh i think it's it's important to be able to rank the things that we worry about on a on a value scale and decide which things to de dedicate more time to and mm. I, I wouldn't dedicate too much more time on this because even the the, the 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 current governor himself has been making this point that the independence of the bank is sacrosanct and this guy and this guy was appointed by uh, jacob zuma mm. so he 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 really he really has been fighting for this independence and he's been making the point that if we destroy this independence we will we will, we will experience hyperinflation in the country so he gets it even though he's probably an anc member and he he wants to keep the bank's independence and so it's important for us to see what happens after this guy's term i think they all have five-year terms they're the reserve bank governors mm. so after the current guy's term we'll see, it's important to uh hold uh make sure that we get a, a new independent governor someone who 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 the market approves of and so that that will still be continue that will still continue being important going forward those are the things that matters who are the governors who are the deputy governors and those like the, those four positions the governor and the, and the three deputy governors are all appointed by the president and those are the most important positions because they uh, they they decide on on appoint or appointing the senior staff for four of which become members of the monetary policy committee so the government already has a uh, de facto control of the bank this will just pay, say okay no this uh we they, they are no longer private shareholders but i, I don't see much change into why what we should still be looking for and we have been looking at is whether the the four governors are independent and which that this should continue being the case we should continue looking at that i'd also just like to make the point about rhetoric and the fact that the president talked about changing that the, the bank will now be owned by the people 
Mm. And whenever a politician talks about ownership by the people, they never assume that that means it's actually going to be owned by South African yeah. citizens. It's going to be ownership by the group which is in, in charge of government at that yeah. point. It might be a political party or some other, you know, race group or class group or whatever. But never, you know, fall for that sort of rhetoric where it, it tries to sell it as this is going to be for a democratic purpose or that kind of thing. It's always, I don't know, there's always more underneath the surface. So, Mpiaki, I appreciate, you know, that the governor's, that his, the current, you know, governor and his track record. But the risk for abuse is so great, I guess, if it's the wrong person, then... <laughs> the, the point is, uh, the, the risk for abuse doesn't increase now. It stays, this, the, 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 mm. the, this, this is... Okay, it might increase marginally mm. because you you have less uh, people asking questions at the AGMs, asking questions of the governors and mm. saying, hey, why have you done this particular decision? Mm. So you have less of that uh, private sector sort of review. Yeah. But the, the, the way I see it, it would be like if you decided that uh, NetLag, you would remove all the all the people representing businesses at NetLag mm. and just make it a union and government thing. That's, that, that's how I see this current change. It's well, fair enough because business in South Africa does have a record of agreeing with government on a lot. Uh, look, so. <laughs> to me, it's, it's a slippery slope. Look, I, I know I get the point of ensuring yeah. that the governors are independent, but I mean, just like with the previous election, we we shouldn't make too big of a deal about personalities. Mm. We should f first and foremost institutions need to be our concern. Now, mm. instead of taking this step and saying nationalize the Reserve Bank, we should say. If you really want it to be owned by the people, as Chris said, rather say we are turning the Reserve Bank into a totally private institution and we are going to give every South African equal shares mm. in name uh, in the Reserve Bank, rather go in that direction. <laughs> I think this step in the direction of giving the state I, I, a formalized control is 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 no matter how marginal yeah. it is mm. it's it's a step in the wrong direction and i mean i i for one do not want my savings to be worth less than toilet paper <laughs> so I'm, I'm very concerned about that so if, if if the government decides to give every south african shares in the reserve bank i would and those shares actually mean control then i would say no i i would i would rather have us have an alternative currency that i can use i'm just that's all i will say because <laughs> i the, the, the risk for populism would be that much greater i think what we should keep looking at because we will know the market will uh, inform us uh, 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 beforehand if a particular governor is not uh, if you pay attention like so those are those are the things that uh, i mean if less than five percent of the countries on earth have uh, have some kind of private ownership in a central bank i think it's going to be hard to defeat this kind of proposal to mm -hmm. be honest because it's already we are in a very rare position and some of the best economies in the world they don't really follow this convention of having private ownership so i think even uh, i don't think we will get much international support i don't think we will get um i mean it, it will it will seem uh, it will be very hard it will seem almost spurious to some people that we would oppose this because just because of the weight of, uh, of public opinion considering mm -hmm. the situation in the rest of the world I mean, it, it's easier for us in, in the case of property rights. We can say, okay, uh, look at the people who have property rights. They are successful. The people who don't have property rights, they're not successful. So we, we should. Well, I think there are things that we can do to to strengthen the bank's independence while not making while making it uh, while while at the same time uh, nationalizing the, the those shares. So while while if if let's say a bill is uh, the government starts proposes a bill that says okay. We want to nationalize the shares maybe there, there's a possibility there that we might actually get to make it more independent by making a couple of reforms one of the reforms might be that uh the, the banks are not uh, the, the governors are not uh are not just appointed by the president that it's actually parliament has a greater role there one of those reforms might be that uh, when 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 the minister uh, in consultation with the governor decide on a policy change with regards to the mandates, it's not just the minister and uh, the, the finance minister and the governor of the bank. It's also involving other actors in society. It's it's having public comments in that policy change. It's having all of those things. So that those are the kinds of reforms that we should be asking for because they would actually make the bank more independent mm -hmm. than it is now. Look, I, I get the point. So we we do have to move on to other topics, yeah. but I think this is an important thing to to uh, to go into. Uh, I do get the point that because it's it's not the norm internationally to have private ownership of banks, that it may be a difficult fight. But you see, that is also a slippery slope. So, for example, mineral rights in South Africa were nationalized in South Africa in two thousand and four. Yeah. 
in terms of the 2002 Mineral and Resources, uh, Mineral and Petroleum Resources Development Act. Now, in England, you also have total public ownership of minerals. The Crown owns it. Mm. Uh, in various other very developed uh, property rights respecting con- countries, the right to mine mineral ownership is reserved to the state in total. The state owns all the minerals, period. The United Nations General Assembly has adopted a uh, resolution that's from the 80s that says they recognize only state sovereignty over minerals, basically no private ownership. Now, if, if we concede that with central banks at some stage, and, and I'm, I'm sure of this, we're going to have to concede it with agricultural land, with private property, eventually everyone's so, going to have, but but uh, the, the point is, the difference is that in those countries, they obviously have institutions that, no. that, have, that have security of tenure, but you, you can't you can't apply that as a blanket because in in Africa and in South Africa, we have a corrupt state. We have a, a, a diseased system of uh, discretionary powers, delegation of powers, complete disrespect for the rule of law. The, you you just cannot take something that has worked elsewhere, like in Hong Kong, complete state ownership of of land. I mean, that is exactly what the left is going to say. Sure, They're sure. doing that elsewhere. Let's do it here. Yeah, sure. So we should not, think... de- uh, I'm, I'm just making the point, we should not let international best practice so-called sure. dictate to us uh, what, what we should I, be doing. I agree 100% with that. And I think the problem, one of the problems that's in the, in the case of central banks, the, the principled uh, fight has already been lost in a way. Yeah. Because the very fact that we have one organization deciding which money we can use exclusively basically creating a, pon- a monopoly on the on the use of money within a country mm. that in, in itself means that the principle has been has been uh, sort of so in my in my my own preference would be we should fight to make sure that we have domestic currency competition and say okay you know nationalize the reserve bank but we, we are allowed to use whatever currency we choose sure. to use yeah. if we want to use dollars or whatever we, we are allowed to do that but i think but I, I don't see anyone willing to take up that fight as far as i can see people want to fight uh, well, people want to fight this uh what i see as a sort of minor fight no one wants to take up the bigger fight because everyone thinks this will be too difficult mm-hmm. so that's that's yeah. the problem no, fair enough. Uh, so talking about hyperinflation, this past week we had a uh, current senator and a uh, human rights lawyer of Zimbabwe, David Coltart, here at the Free Market Foundation. He spoke to us a bit about uh, uh, what happened in Zimbabwe, the political, economic and human- humanitarian crises that have gripped that country over the last few decades, but especially in the last few months uh, with the military being de- deployed into Bulawayo and Harare. Uh, with various people being killed um and and he also traced some of the causes of 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 the problem and i think uh, if i recall correctly he said that number one it's it's basically a lack of respect for constitutionalism uh the he said that the 2013 constitution of zimbabwe is actually a, a pretty good constitution but the government just couldn't care less about adhering to it um, and then uh, I think he talked about, um, uh, he, he uses a specific word, but I think it, it's, it's along the lines of uh, the, the, the people and, and, and the justice system are refusing to hold certain people who have throughout Zimbabwe's history been continuously implicated in crimes against humanity, against, uh, in, in massive cases of corruption, to a refusal to hold them accountable. Um, and and, and that, that culture has just resulted in these same people being at the very pinnacle of government today so what can you expect about uh, the, the whole thing just just falling apart and i i, I can't recall the, the third thing you mentioned but i know you talked a lot about monetary policy as well and about the reserve bank saying something about yeah don't worry we have complete parity with the us dollar and then the minister of finance saying no no that's ridiculous and then like the, le- the one left hand of government doesn't know what the other left hand is doing. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I don't know what uh, you guys thought about the talk. Uh, Chris, uh, I know you were there in the beginning for a while. Or what do you think? Well, I thought I wanted to link this to what you said earlier about personalities and the power thereof. And he talked about how even for him, he had a hope in the beginning of the new dispensation where he thought things were going to change uh, after Mugabe's time, mm. how you know they were going to turn the country around, the economy was going to grow again, reforms, etc., etc., but how even now he's been proven wrong. Mm. So it just shows you when the government is as powerful as the one in Zimbabwe mm. is and the South African one is becoming, if just the wrong person, you know, not that if, if the wrong person by any metric, it, he can be a the complete brutal dictator or just sort of an autocrat. Yeah. If the power is that much, anyone can abuse it. 
So that's a, one of the best arguments I know of in favor of small, limited government. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, if you're worried about, for example, the role of Donald Trump in your life, yeah. you should be in favor of a smaller yeah. government because if someone like him comes to power, he won't be able to take away your rights yeah. and mm-hmm. abuse you like you know has been said. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know. I, I, I agree with you guys. I mean, they're, they're just tracing the just tracing back the crisis to the to the to the fact that there was an improper uh, going back to when independence was uh, was achieved to the Lancaster agreement when uh, there was an improper separation between the different arms of the state mm. and that how that eventually led to the current situation and i sort of see the, a similar situation not of course it won't be the, exactly the same but i sort of see a similar situation as in as in south africa where we have uh, the president having so much power into up to appointing what we, for example what we were just talking about now the power to appoint the reserve bank governor yeah. the power to appoint the head of intelligence to appoint, the power to appoint the head of the npa and so on and so on that is is that is not a good thing for any mm-hmm. society and this we saw this how these powers were abused with jacob zuma and sort of thank god for jacob zuma because we saw how these powers can be abused yeah. instead, <laughs> instead of an increment in, in, in crimin, incremental uh, change and yeah. abusing these powers yeah. Just going from zero to a hundred. <laughs> we should it's... build statues in his honor and, exactly. and making us realize these things. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, uh, the executive director of the Free Market Foundation, Leon Lowe, always makes this this point. He, he says Zuma was a, a gift to South Africa because he his conduct, especially with uh, uh, the constitution and so on, these appointments, basically showed what happens mm. when you give government too much power. Mm. He basically, and I mean, when you started to see this, that people were saying, no, the government is now completely corrupt mm. and there is no more hope for government. And to an extent, the ruling party did, did start losing support because of this. Uh, it's, it's unclear whether South Africans have taken this to heart. Um, I, I guess I can say that I see more discussion about limiting the power of the state now than I did two or three years ago. No. I, it, marginally more. I can't. No. I, I won't say that it's now a, a hot topic. I do see a little bit more of it. This this little fledgling liberal movement is <laughs> growing slowly. Uh, so I, I guess yeah, you you have a point that that Jacob Zuma should be thanked for this. And and I mean I I, I take the point that David Coulthard makes. He says that. Zimbabweans are actually quite smart people. Mm. There, there is no real race, race, racial tension like we have in South Africa. Mm. People just get along, but it seems like they have the same problem we do, in that they just can't get rid of this government. No. And I mean, this is a problem throughout Africa. I talk to my colleagues around the continent very often, and we're all just confused <laughs> because, and I mean, South Africans as well. We just sit here and let the government hit us with a. a, a I don't know, a shambok or something. And we're just like, oh, please don't do that. Please don't do that. But give me more, please. Yeah. So, uh, it's, it's as Africans, we are supposed to be the yeah. most libertarian people yeah. in history. After <laughs> all, so. <laughs> after all the nonsense yeah. we have been through, yeah. we should be the most libertarian people in history, but it, it's not happening. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you guys have anything to add on Zimbabwe. Yeah, no, it's, uh, it's, uh, I'd want, uh, when you made that point about the Zimbabwean social cohesion being better in South Africa, I sort of wondered if that maybe wasn't part of their problem is that they trust each other that much so that when they appoint <laughs> when they appoint a the guy like they think okay this is our guy we can give him all the power now yeah. whereas in south africa when we appoint someone like there's always going to be someone who's oh i don't like that guy <laughs> so I, I i wondered about that yeah. <laughs> yeah a little bit of division i guess is is good i i always hear all my eyes at americans saying oh we are so divided today it's <laughs> it's terrible and i'm like you should thank the lord that you are so divided today because finally the left in america seems to be coming around to federalism Mm. to an extent and i mean uh it it just seems like there's a a far more healthy debate Mm. about politics in america because of the so-called polarization it's like (laughs) Thank the Lord for your polarization, because the moment you achieve consensus in society about what government is doing, you're in trouble. Mm -hmm. And I mean, uh, uh, going over to our last topic for today is uh, Venezuela, uh, the the tripartite of South Africa, Zimbabwe and Venezuela, which keeps reappearing in these podcasts. (laughs) But we're going to keep doing that until this government learns. I mean, th- that, that's what happened there. Uh, Hugo Chavez was was accepted with uh, with open arms in mm-hmm. the late 90s. He was a, a breath of fresh air, apparently. And now it's it's just 
chaos and death. Uh, uh, Dr. Sherry Levy uh, of, I think it's the National Central Venezuelan University, mm. uh, wrote an article for the Free Market Foundation, which was published today in uh, City Press. Yeah, uh, yeah and, and City Press. I, I would recommend you all go read it, talking about some of these things. And I think Mpiaki uh, is just most familiar with, with some of the points she made there. Yes, I just uh, collected some of the stats that she, which were personally shocking to me, and the article will be linked to in the description, I think. So uh, the, the PDF, PDVSA, the, the state-owned oil company, mm. is producing a, a third of what it, it used to produce before. It's just, uh, I mean, it's due to the to the loss of, it's the, due to, to the destruction of the economy due to the, the uh, destruction of property rights and the rule of law. Uh, the government debt went over 19 years. It went from $35 billion to $185 billion. 87% 87 of the people are poor. There are 300,000 people that are close to debt. And then there have been uh, five massive protest marches that to try and remove the government in power. And they have all failed because that's what happens when you, don't, when you, when you no longer have property rights. Mm -hmm. You can protest all you want, but the government ultimately owns everything and they can pay the army to kill you so yeah. it's just it's just it's just shocking to me that uh, there are so much still we have so many clear lessons from these countries venezuela and zimbabwe and we we still refuse to learn these lessons it's sad but that's what's happening yeah chris any any views on on uh, the venezuelan situation and uh, what what uh, dr levy has been saying yeah i thought when she talked about the protests in the article you you have to also think about the, what happened in venezuela regarding um uh, citizens' ability to be armed. Mm. Uh, they long ago outlawed okay. private ownership of firearms, and as you've written before, Martin, uh, the importance of being able to defend yourself. It's well and good to have property rights in a constitution, but mm. without some sort of ability to defend what you own, mm. the government can come in at any point, and now they've been shooting people during these protests yeah. and that mm. kind of thing. And also, I guess, the the point that we that libertarians make a lot, but which bears repeating, and history shows the lessons. People never flee towards socialist countries. They always yeah. flee from yeah. outwards, from this, mm -hmm. this mass migration out yeah. from Venezuela, mm -hmm. northwards towards capitalist, imperialist America. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, why, I wonder why they are running away from the socialist paradise. Yeah, what could, what could be yeah. happening, Martin? I don't yeah. understand. You can have free healthcare, everything in Venezuela. Why would uh, you leave? Are, are, or do you mean they're fleeing out of Venezuela to Cuba? Uh, or <laughs> is that what you're trying to say? No, no. I've I, heard good things about Cuban cigars. They so maybe. They're avoiding Cuba for some reason. They should be, to be going to Chile, Colombia, and all this kind of... Well, I don't know what's happening there. Yeah, no, don't it's funny. It's... Like, when you track the little boats from Venezuela, they, they tend to, like, go around the island of Cuba, and then they end up in Florida. It's, it's quite perplexing. But, yeah, uh, just a final point on, on this before we close. Um that I made in an article uh, when the Venezuelan crisis was still young, uh, is that South Africa, re comma, Republic of, finds itself on the side of the current regime in Venezuela, mm. along with such illustrious company as uh, Cuba, Russia, North Korea, uh, I think El Salvador Iran. or something. Yeah, Iran. <laughs> I mean, here we have a constitution that is venerated in the west yeah. that says we are a open and democratic society founded on the values of the rule of law human the advancement of human rights and freedoms the advancement of equality we have all these great rights many of which are intensely libertarian in character and then what our government decides to do is throw its support behind a little tyrant who is actively stopping aid from uh, crossing the border into his country and uh, getting to his starving people, mm. uh, actively killing people in the streets, who has completely undermined the very imperfect Venezuelan constitution. He basically reconstituted the Supreme Court and the legislature as little puppets, just like that. And South Africa decided, yeah, no, it, it, makes, it makes sense <laughs> for us to uh, support him and not the other guy, who I he's, he's by no means a free marketeer, no, Juan, no. Juan Guaido. He is a leftist, mm. but at least he has some semblance of a respect for constitutionalism. Mm. But we chose the one who could not care less about respecting the democratic process. I mean, this is intensely worrying that 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 we're doing this, and we're we're still cozying up to the regime in Venezuela in Zimbabwe as well. Mm. I. It's it's sad. It's sad that South Africans are not at that stage where we can say we need to show solidarity with the oppressed peoples of Zimbabwe and Venezuela and say either stay out of it or pick pick the right side. 
yeah, it's it's uh, bleak times, ladies and gentlemen. But uh, we, what we need to make sure is that South Africa does not fall into the same situations that our neighbor to the north and uh, a very similar situation in Venezuela has has uh, uh, happened. So yeah, uh, I hope you've enjoyed this morbid uh, episode of the Free Marketeers. Uh, as always, please subscribe to to our YouTube channel. It's the big red button right below the video. Um, follow us on facebook uh, like us on facebook that is uh free uh free market foundation south africa or uh, facebook.com slash fmfsa and uh of course follow us on twitter that is at fmf south africa and of course always visit our website www.freemarketfoundation.com thank you cheers <laughs>